Eh, nada, bueno, pues simplemente le voy a dar la palabra enseguida a María Jaén, la presidenta de Helsinki España, para que presente la sesión y presente a, a Olga. Eh, mi papel aquí es dar la bienvenida, como ya os como ya os estuve comentando ayer, nosotros desde la universidad lo que hacemos es acoger este programa impulsado desde la embajada de Estados Unidos en España y, y desarrollado por, por Helsinki España y que luego tiene la fase de concurso, a la que también si te hay preguntas al final de la sesión, pues también podemos tener un hueco y contamos también con la ganadora del año pasado que también nos dirigirá unas palabras al final de la sesión eh, y podéis preguntarle cómo gano y ella os dirá que no lo sabe. Así que ya os, ya os eh, avanzo las respuestas. Y sin más dilación, pues bueno, agradeceros que estéis aquí. Thank you very much, Olga, por being here with us and to share this, uh, your knowledge with us and your experience. Bueno, pues, bienvenidos. Buenas tardes a todos. Bien, bien, bien. Primero agradecer a Héctor, que nos haya acogido también en esta universidad, en vuestra universidad. Estamos muy felices de estar aquí por la universidad de Puerto Rico de Precioso, entonces, eh, de mis ambas cosas. Y, bueno, la Embajada de Consulado de los Estados Unidos en España y Andorra, poniendo en relieve su compromiso permanente con el fomento del diálogo, la colaboración y la innovación en el ámbito de la defensa, financia y pone en marcha la cuarta edición del proyecto Defensa y Yo. Este año lo hace en colaboración con esta entidad, el CIGI España. El CIGI España en Dimensión Humana es una organización de derechos humanos creada en 1992 para promover el cumplimiento de los principios relativos a los derechos humanos y las libertades fundamentales del Acta Final de Helsinki, de la Organización de Seguridad y Cooperación en Europa, de la OSCE. Promovemos el conocimiento y la reflexión sobre los derechos humanos, el desarrollo sostenible y la construcción de paz a través de programas educativos. Actualmente, nuestro trabajo lo tenemos dividido en dos áreas. Una, hacia la formación de universitarios y todos los temas relacionados con los derechos humanos. Y otra, a la formación de graduados, civiles, militares y fuerzas de seguridad de los estados en construcción de paz y resolución de conflictos. En una era marcada por los rápidos avances tecnológicos, los cambios geopolíticos y las amenazas emergentes, la necesidad de una estrategia de defensa sólida y adaptable no ha sido tan crítica. Las conferencias de defensa y lo 4.0 nos ofrecen una plataforma única para reunirnos, compartir ideas y trazar el rumbo del futuro de la defensa en el siglo XXI. Estas conversaciones son cruciales ya que marcarán el camino a seguir influyendo en las políticas, las estrategias y el propio tejido de nuestra seguridad colectiva. Os animo a que participéis activamente, formuléis preguntas y contribuyáis con vuestras ideas en esta sesión. Hoy contamos con la ponencia con doña Olga Kakova, directora adjunta de Seguridad Energética Europea y del Global Energy Center de la Atlantic Council y dirige la cooperación transatlántica para sincronizar la seguridad climática y la energía. Ha encabezado iniciativas como la corriente de innovación del Global Energy Center y el concurso Model COP26, abordando esas cuestiones mediante informes, conferencias de alto nivel. Destacada participante en diversos medios de comunicación, aparece con frecuencia en las principales cadenas y ha sido publicada en medios de nombre. Anteriormente, Tacoba coordinó programas en la US Energy Association y dirigió iniciativas con las del mercado eléctrico de los Balcanes Occidentales. También dirigió programas de CLIMB, Blue Energy Project, centrándose en la defensa de las energías limpias y la participación de las partes interesadas. Su experiencia se extiende a la organización de programas de seguridad aérea y a su participación en la Junta Directiva del Consejo de Mujeres sobre Energía y Medio Ambiente. Cacoba posee un máster de ciencias profesionales en evaluación medioambiental por la Universidad de Kansas. Mrs. Cacoba, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. The floor is yours. Yeah. 
Oh, thank you so much for this kind introduction. And thank you so much for hosting me. Uh, what a beautiful campus. I feel like you all are going to school in a museum. Very jealous in the best way possible. So I hope you recognize that and appreciate that. It's, it's a beautiful, beautiful space. Um, it's an honor to be here. Uh, as mentioned, Olga Hakova. I work at the Atlantic Council. How many of you know what a think tank is? Okay. Uh, to be completely honest, uh, before I moved to Washington, D.C., I had no idea what a think tank was. I was like, okay, that just sounds funny, right? But we do a lot of research. Uh, we do convenings. Um, our Atlantic Council has been around for over 60 years, and we were very much founded on transatlantic cooperation on many different areas and the importance of alliance. Um, we grew from, I would say, the first 30, 40 years of the council, we were 10, 15, 20, you know, maybe 30 people. In the last uh, 20 or so or less years, we grew uh, tremendously into hundreds of employees. We also have a network of non-resident senior fellows, so our experts all around the world, 500 to 700 experts all around that we can tap into for research. Uh, we work on many different issues. We have 16 different departments. Uh, some are organized uh, by location, like regional de uh, departments, for example. I um, And then I work on European energy security, but I'm in, the, in more of the thematic uh, side of Atlantic Council. We also have thematic departments, uh, some that work on cybersecurity, some that work on defense. I work on energy. And of course, we cooperate between our regional departments and our thematic teams, uh, but we cover global issues. But just wanted to reiterate that our organization's beginning was very much focused on the transatlantic relationship. So it's great to be here. But before I start uh, to dive into some of my uh, points for today, I wanted to get a better understanding of who we have in the audience. Uh, from what I understand, uh, most of you uh, are majoring or focused on in political science, geopolitics. Raise your hand if that's your major or if that's your focus of studies or law. Are any of you studying political science or not, not a single person here? No. No. OK. How about law? Well, there are people that. OK, study. law. How about law? OK. All right. So we have great communications or business. All right. OK. Who did I miss? Shout out your shout out your majors who I missed. Yes. Amazing. OK. Who else? In the in the majors that I didn't mention. OK, so for predominantly uh, we have OK, very good law, international relations, really good group. Fantastic. Well, I think I think you're in the right place. Uh, I think we're in the right topic. Uh, in terms of kind of where your dream jobs would be, um, I know that right now you have tons and tons of uh, interesting directions that you can consider in terms of your future. Um, ideally, for some of you, where how many of you uh, envision yourselves working for your dream job would be to work for uh, a company as soon as you graduate or a private sector? OK, so a couple of people. Um, OK, very good. Um, I, uh, how many of you would like to end up in a political office or working in politics? All right, nice, nice group. Okay. Uh, how about NGO nonprofits that work on solving, you know, some of the global geopolitical issues, humanitarian issues? Okay, nice combination. I, I like it. All right. Um, and then any other more like technical, you know, highly technical science-based uh, areas, uh, research or even academia, research or academia or teaching. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, I think you're, you're already kind of set on that. <laughs> um, no, th th it's very, very helpful to, to know who's, who's in the audience, um, you know, as, as I go through my topics. I want this to be as interactive as possible because I know it's hard to sit and listen to someone talk for a while. So I want you to start thinking about the questions, the comments, any feedback that you have or ideas, um, and we'll leave plenty of time towards the end for us to for us to talk because that's that's really my favorite part of of this conversation. So I will give you just a quick uh, summary of kind of, you know, having studied energy security and paid attention to kind of how it has developed, uh, especially in the last several years, you know, with the shock of COVID and then having the energy crisis come out of 
uh, Russia's bloody war in Ukraine and the withholding of supplies. I'll give you my observation of kind of the lessons learned from these massive events most recently, but also maybe perhaps lessons unlearned, you know, maybe things that we need to remember, things that we need to reiterate or try to remember uh, following these, these massive changes, these shocks to the energy systems. And I'll also talk about how energy, uh, and we've seen this in real life, how energy interconnects into everything we do, any of the topics, any of the majors that you're studying, any of the career paths that you'll be embarking on, energy security, uh, climate, reducing emissions, all of that will be very connected uh, to anything we do in the future in the next several decades. Um, so just a couple of quick lessons learned. Um, and then again, I welcome your questions if you want me to dive in into any of these topics in greater detail. So we did learn the dangers of over-reliance on one supplier. So in this case, Russia used to send, uh, used to represent 40% of Europe's natural uh, gas market share. That's a lot. So when they started their brutal war on Ukraine uh, and they wanted to push Europe into minimizing their support for Ukraine, they wanted, they, uh, Putin just stopped sending gas to Europe. A massive shock when you're getting, you know, maybe not all 40% were taken off the market right away, but a pretty significant portion of that was. So Europe in record time had to shift this massive percentage of its energy supplies from somewhere else, what were the options? Spain is a really interesting case because you have some of the most robust LNG infrastructure in Europe. Now, if you look at some of the other countries that are kind of landlocked or, and they're not well connected, they didn't have you know, as many options and they were in a lot more trouble um, in terms of access to these alternative routes. So they really didn't have too many options. However, you know, the built out of infrastructure over the last, even before the war, over the last uh, 20 years and the EU level support that went into creating all of these interconnectors between countries um, and, you know, an additional storage and, and, all, and all of these infrastructure investments that really set up Europe to be in a position to with, withstand this energy crisis. Had those interconnections not been implemented, um, we would have had a very different conversation today. However, it wasn't, as you recall, <laughs> the, you know, um, it wasn't an easy or a cheap winter. Uh, in 2020, uh, 2023, last, um, if we look into last year, 2022, 2023 winter was extremely expensive for Europe. Roughly, and I, I think that probably doesn't even cover all of the expenses, but roughly a trillion dollars was spent to make sure that uh, businesses, households were supported. There were expenditures done at the EU level and, of course, at the national level, too. So both putting strains on the overall EU budget and also the different countries' budgets as well. But Europe stood together in, with partners like U.S. and others and said, no, Russia, you will not be able to coerce us to, to hold us hostage uh, through your withholding of supplies. Nice try, but we're not going to let you do this. However, it came at a cost, of course, and we're still learning more about what that meant for the industry. And we're still figuring out what does a more permanent long term future without Russian supply looks like for Europe? What does it mean for energy prices? What does it mean for industrial competitiveness? What does it mean for Europe's relations with other suppliers in terms of LNG or perhaps uh, you know, clean energy supply chains or nuclear supply chains for those countries that see nuclear as a massive part of their energy mix in the future? So one of the lessons learned was making sure that there's no over-reliance on just one supplier. And I will even push it even further. And I think a lot of countries have learned it that even, yes, in this case, it was Russia, but even over reliance on one supplier that may be currently an ally, uh, just to make sure that you're nice and diversified. So why is this still relevant as we talk about the future? When we look into the clean energy transformation that's happening across Europe and the United States and across the world, we will need robust, robust uh, supply chains of critical minerals, metals and other components uh, that will be necessary to build out the clean energy, renewable energy sources and other uh, solutions and other technologies at scale really, really fast in order to hit those 2030, 2040 goals that were just announced, clarified, and our 2050 net zero targets. 
So making sure that we learn those lessons of, all right, we saw that overall reliance. And today, unfortunately, there's, again, this huge, massive reliance on clean energy materials that are needed for clean energy transition, like critical minerals, on China. So what does that mean for us? You know, I, there are some voices saying, well, we must work together, U.S. and Europe and other countries must work together to figure out how we can, you know, you know, have a world, have a supply chain without without China when it comes to critical minerals or other clean energy technologies, that's not realistic. The reality is that China will continue playing a massive role in the clean energy supply chain. However, however, we must still look at ways to diversify it and de-risk it. And that, that's the more realistic, that, that, that is an approach that is actually something we can work towards instead of you know, kind of setting something up that we know is not possible. What does that look like? It's a combination of both uh, recycling and optimizing how the existing technologies are used to make sure that it's used as efficiently as possible. So whatever your solar panel or your wind turbine is producing, it is optimized. And when it's delivered across the electricity grid, that you're not losing a lot of electricity. So every step of that way, we want to make sure that it's as efficient as possible. Then looking into how do we partner on you know, there's mining of critical minerals, but there's also processing. China dominates both of these, and they're both equally important. When we talk about critical minerals and how rare they are, they're not really that rare, right? It's just getting to them, the mines that are out there that are built in the infrastructure to get to them, and then these massive processes to move that material and get it processed into something that we can actually use in solar panels, in wind turbines, and in our technologies, in our computers. That's that's the part that's just as important as that physical mind and getting to those materials as well. So partnering together with our allies on improving the environmental impact of mining in other in third countries, whether it's in, uh, in some of the African countries, whether it's in Australia, whether it's in other parts of the world, but also looking into opportunities in United States, in Europe, where you could access and process these critical minerals. Uh, again, not saying that we'll be able to switch 100% away from China, not realistic, but to have several other options will be critical. So that way, five years or 10 years, you know, we're, Europe and the United States are not in a position where countries could hold us hostage to their supply chains ever again. And I would argue that the critical, you know, the clean energy supply chains are going to, are, are already as important for energy security, for energy access, for affordability of energy, um, as we saw, you know, gas uh, was for, as, you know, as Europe was moving through the energy crisis. So that's that's one one lesson, making sure we don't forget that. I talked a little bit about efficiency um, initially, but I think starting any kind of conversation as we look into transforming our energy systems from how do we get it to be the least amount of wasteful, there's still opportunities, and I would say huge opportunity for us in United States and European countries and you know, bilateral cooperation with countries like Spain and others in the region to work together on efficiency solutions. Uh, I'll just give you a couple of examples. Uh, heat pumps have become very popular. How many are you familiar with heat pumps? So they're, the, uh, they're efficient mechanisms for minimizing how much, uh, how much energy you use at home um, for heating or cooling. So they can serve both. So technologies like this, but there, so in this example, there is a significant initial cost when you install something like this. So when you are trying to change a massive system and say, we're going to have this new exciting technology integrated, you have to think about all the steps of the way of how are households or businesses going to finance it? How will it be integrated into the existing electricity system? What will happen as houses switch from gas to electric and implementing, you can, you can actually utilize heat pumps in both systems, not, not only electric, but I'm using electric as an example. So as you think about these solutions, tons of opportunities to make our systems more efficient. So every step of the way from the point when the energy is generated or from you know, whatever that energy comes from, however it was derived, to the point where it's delivered across the grid, to the point where it's used at households or businesses, finding ways to 
to make the molecules go or electrons go further, work harder for us. Um, another uh, key uh, takeaway, you know, just kind of looking into um, the, the last several years and, and trying to anticipate well, what could potentially be the next crisis and how do we avoid it together? Looking into the kind of changes we need to make across our grids uh, and making sure that the grid infrastructure is ready for that influx of clean energy and a more dynamic, uh, more complex energy systems where you have people plugging in cars or potentially producing your own electricity at home and then sending it back off to the grid. So. The reason why I'm mentioning it, I want to get too technical, is because when we're talking about a systematic transformation, yes, it can, you know, we start off with some of the technical, we start off with the goal of where do we want to be at 2030, 2040, 2050. Then we take a look at what's realistic in terms of our supply chains, what we have we established, how do we want those supply chains to change? And that's when the geopolitical discussion, that's when the partnerships, that's when working with other countries and developing robust relationships with others um, really comes into play. And that's an important step. And the reason why I brought up the grids, I don't want to you know, dive into too many details here, but because as we prepare our systems for this ma major change, uh, and this includes United States too, it's really important to have communities understand of what does that mean for their neighborhoods? If you're going to have a built out, you know, expanded or upgraded grids infrastructure, or maybe perhaps grid interconnections in areas where there weren't any grids before, you know, making sure that communities understand why that's happening and why that pathway um, is, you know, is the way to go for the city, but also engaging communities from the beginning instead of just kind of, you know, coming in and saying, all right, this is the best way for us to decarbonize this city and this city, and, then, and we have to do it this way. But having that grassroots engagement and understanding saying, look, you know, Spain has is rich in clean energy resources, uh, you know, a tremendously tremendous opportunity here for wind, for solar, hydro, right? Uh, and it's, you know, ahead of the curve of a lot of other European nations. A lot of your other European nations don't have as many options. So taking advantage of that, but also explaining, kind of working with communities of, well, what does that mean for the level of battery storage that we'll have to have in our communities? Where, and then again, back to my earlier statement, where are these batteries going to come from and where this material is going to come from? I know you have some really cool factories here and some uh, uh, companies here that are producing some of some of these battery systems. That's not that's again, that's incredible because that goes back to self-reliance and being able to produce not only that, but some of the wind turbines as well. Really fantastic. But taking it one step further of where the materials for these wind turbines, for these solar panels are coming in. Uh, and then how do we then work with communities together to make sure that all of these technologies are properly integrated? Uh, so, so that's just one kind of piece of how geopolitics connects to the local changes that are seen as this massive transformation takes place and getting ahead of future issues, for example, as grid congestions, as insufficient interconnections, we're seeing already some lessons in some parts of Europe, uh, for example, in Romania, where they're, you know, they've just, um, you know, developed some additional uh, wind farms and clean energy resources. But some of those resources are stranded because they're not very well connected. So, again, coming, you know, making sure that those kinds of issues uh, don't be become a constraint, but also an economic burden. And then one last thing I'll mention before I want to hear from you and your questions and your comments and we can really dive into some of these details but how energy connects to the broader kind of economic competitiveness um, and the industrial kind of potential opportunities in, in the countries um, some of the demand drop that we've seen following the energy crisis last winter some of that demand drop was efficiency mechanism, clean energy technologies, using energy smarter and better. However, some of that demand drop unfortunately came from industry closing down or leaving. Now, that is not a direction. That is, I call it, you know, there's good energy efficiency and there's and there's bad demand, demand destruction. Demand destruction that's 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 coming from businesses stopping working and that's why the demand has dropped that is not that is not the future that is not the direction the european economies want to go or any economies want to go we want to make the energy go further while producing the same amount or more in a cleaner more efficient 
uh, in a more resilient way. That is that is the future and that is the question. Now, um, I will use Germany as an example here, um, you know, being one of the more robust industrial economies across Europe. It has the impact has been very significant. Germany's economy compared to other countries in Europe has actually, uh, you know, suffered uh, last year. And you can see it in their GDP numbers. You can see it across their economic uh, numbers. And a lot of that had to do with high energy prices. So the question that we all have, you know, kind of have to think through in cooperation with allies like United States and others is how to keep that competitive age, a competitive edge on producing energy, but also making sure that in the long term, businesses and households can can have access to affordable energy. Now, again, because Spain is so rich in clean energy resources, I was just, you know, just reading up on some of the recent news like last month, how how much the prices have dropped because of the clean energy production here. But unfortunately, such such is not the case in many other parts of Europe. Again, those who perhaps not have as many as much access to renewable energy. That's why a lot of these countries are turning to nuclear energy. I know, and I know that that's a divisive topic in Europe because there's quite a few countries that are really trying to reinvigorate the nuclear industry. And there's some countries that are taking a step back and trying to phase it out. Spain has incredible nuclear energy expertise here. And I know that there's a plan to phase it out, but it's an incredible opportunity to share that expertise, to share that knowledge, because one of the things that we're short on today across Europe, and I would say in the United States, is that level of specific expertise in nuclear energy particularly. So as we think about why is it important to talk about you know, price competitiveness, and it's not just industrial production, but it's also making sure that households can afford uh, you know, basic necessities in life and the quality of life uh, stays, uh, stays nice and high, because in, in times and in cases when it doesn't, you do have stronger populists, more extremist voices saying, looking inward and saying, when, you know, let's stop cooperation with these countries or those countries or these allies. Let's really, you know, let's really look into our own only national interests. And so you have those populist voices go growing louder and louder in cases where the high energy prices, deindustrialization is happening. And that's why, you know, it, it's a concerning, it's a concerning trend for some parts of Europe. Uh, and there's really tons of opportunities where U.S., and other allies, other countries around the world can work with Europe and then on bilateral basis with Spain, particularly on figuring out how do we help each other stay competitive, particularly in the world today where, you know, uh, we are asking questions around what is the future without Russian uh, energy sources in European mix looks like? And not just, you know, in a couple of months and the next year, but what does that look like permanently? Um, because I would argue that there's going to be a risk if the economic situation gets tough and if there's additional energy stresses to the system, that there could be some voices, uh, some traders, some buyers across Europe calling for partial return to some of Russian natu uh, natural gas flows. And we're already seeing increase in LNG exports from Russia to Europe. So the pipe exports have decreased tremendously below 10%. However, the LNG exports, that has actually we've seen an increase even last year. And Russia is really betting on ways to increase their LNG capacity, develop new projects like Arctic 2, in order to be able to make up for those tremendous losses that they're facing on the piped LNG income. So I know I just threw a lot at you. Uh, I hope it wasn't too technical. I try to keep it slightly kind of higher level, but I am very curious to hear from you and what would you, what would be interesting for you to dive into, to discuss, uh, whether it's a comment or a question. Uh, I'm just really curious to hear in terms of where, where you'd like to take this conversation. Don't be shy. Thank you. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Shyness is one thing and to be unpolite is another one. Um, I'm going to put this here. Okay. 
Okay, let's go to the questions. Uh, you can make your question in English, which is preferred, but if you can't or don't want to, you can make it in Spanish and I try to do my best. And if I can't, maybe Rocio will help me out here. So <clears throat> I'm not going to use my... Yes. I want to know what is your opinion about the attack of the United States and Norway of the pipe pipelines of Nord Stream. On oh, the on the Nord on the Nord Stream uh, two and Nord Stream one pipelines is that what you're saying? Okay, um, so the pipelines for those of you who are, just just a quick summary of the pipelines. Uh, Nord Stream one pipeline was already uh, already working, uh, sending gas to Germany. Nord Stream two pipelines, they each have two streams. Um, Nord Stream two pipeline was completed, but it never started sending gas to Europe uh, because as and this was before the war, because nations uh, like Denmark um, around, you know, that are close to the pipeline network um, ended up, uh, you know, not allowing the not approving the regulatory steps in order for it to be approved to be able to start sending the actual. But the pipeline, uh, the Nord Stream 2 pipeline is is complete, was completed now. Uh, Thank you for mentioning uh, there was an incident and the pipelines, both pipelines were blown up. Now, uh, three out of the four strings, so like I said, two strings each, three out of the four strings were uh, damaged. So nothing could go through those three strings until it's fixed. Um, and then the fourth string is still, is still functional. Um, so there have been there has been some additional information uh, in the news, and I'm following that closely in terms of additional details on who was was at fault, who sabotaged it, who did this. Additional research is being done. I don't think we have a hundred percent. Like this is you know we know for a fact that who is responsible, but there's more details coming out of of how this how this was planned. And and your question was particularly on. The, the uh, my opinion on on why it was blown up or or, or the implications or what? The opinion of the European Union about. I mean, it's it's infrastructure sabotage, so it's it's a it's a serious event, and it's it's on European soil. So first, you know, first of all, like my personal opinion, you know, that that's a significant e event, and it needs to be further investigated. Um, I mean, I can't speak on behalf of like European like Union or what they're coming in, but it's but it's a serious attack, and it's something that uh, I think more information is coming to light on. Who was responsible? How the operation actually took uh, took place? Uh, but I think something as serious as this, uh, we need to get more information and uh, figure out the steps by steps on who was responsible and, and make sure that proper actions are are taken. Yes. And supplies and uh, maybe like to the politics of Europe, like um, for example, in the early days, uh, like conversing with Eastern countries and depending so much on on the United States, for example, mm -hmm. as, as, as it was an, an option to to have for them. Yes, I want to ask. Yeah, so just to understand the question. So, this supply chains and reliance on United States too much. Is are you talking about LNG reliance or uh, are you talking about? Uh, sorry, just to. Sorry. Uh, can, you, can you clarify? Yeah. What? I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. Just so I can make sure I understand. Yeah. Okay. There was a discussion about bringing the oil straight from the United States instead of getting it from the Eastern country mm -hmm. to Europe. Oh, oh, I see. Okay. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Okay. So regarding oil. Okay. So oil is a lot more fungible than like piped gas. When you have piped gas, it's like that is your route and that is where you're you know, sending it. 
LNG. So you kind of in terms of fungibility, when I say fungibility, it's how easy can a resource move around the world? Not only how easy, but how interchangeable it is. So for example, can you exchange, you know, if one country is not producing or someone else is not making it or sending it, how quickly will the market react and substitute it? So oil is the most, you know, fluid, most movable, most fungible commodity out there in terms of energy flows. It is the easiest one to kind of, not not easiest one, there are cost differences in terms of how far the vessels travel, right? So that's that's kind of a bit of a, a an, an add-on and that's what makes slightly of a difference. Sometimes it could take longer for tankers, you know, if they're changing their direction, they go, oh, I'm getting paid more to send this oil here. Just kidding, I'm gonna turn around and come here. That might add, you know, more expenses in terms of shipping, in terms of time, but in terms of movability and how oil can travel around the world, uh, that makes it a, a slightly different conversation. So if one country or an entire continent you know, was to say, you know, we're completely banning, you know, oil from this or that country, um, it it has it, it doesn't have as clear or as strong implication as targeting it right at the source. So this is why price cap sanctions were introduced on Russian oil coming out, because the idea was to keep Russian oil in the market, to keep the markets nice and steady. We talked about the importance of keeping the prices down, right? But also making sure that uh, if uh, that that Russia couldn't sell it, couldn't make tremendous profits because then they just take those profits and they invest it in wars and aggression in Ukraine and other countries within their neighborhood. Um, so that that was the idea behind price caps because because oil is so fungible because it moves around. If you were to only choose a solution where you say one country says no to oil from this other country because it can move around so much, uh, it's more impactful to go directly at the country that's sending out the oil. So in this case, price caps. Initially, price cap sanctions worked really well. La Russia lost billions of dollars um, because if they were to sell oil above $60, they could not use international Western shipping services. They could not use Western insurance. They could not use any kind of other services. Now, how, what Russia did is they went and they bought up a bunch of really old tankers. Tankers, a lot of them were meant to go to savage yards. I mean, a lot of them were meant to just retire. They were worth more money until Russia wanted them. These ships were worth more money as scrap metal than actual ships. So what Russia did said, okay, we you know, cannot use Western services to do this. So let us buy, you know, they went off on the, spent a bunch of billions of dollars on these ships. Again, money diverted away from war. Otherwise they would have spent this money again on, on attacking Ukraine, on the brutalities in Ukraine. So in some ways, initially, uh, this, these price caps work really well. Uh, there's talks about how to strengthen them now because over the last six months, we've seen how agile Russia has been in finding ways of uh, either sneaking around the price cap or using their own ships. Uh, but the coalition, the sanctioning coalition, uh, G7, has um, has found ways to, uh, to tighten those sanctions and make them more impactful. We're not done yet. Uh, Russia is still finding ways to uh, you know, to go around the price gap in, in, some, in some instances. But overall, I would say last year, they lost billions of dollars because of the price gap. And that was more impactful, I would say, than maybe perhaps only doing like bilateral bans between one country purchasing another country's oil. I hope that that makes sense. I know it's easy to get too technical and too, too nerdy when we get into some of these uh, energy points. I hope that that was clear. Uh, but any other questions? Did that did that answer your question? First of all, was that was that clear or no? More or less, did you, what what else? How did you want me to clarify it? Yes. And if we don't have a Russia, why supplies? We should look after other places. Oh, suppliers for, for oil? Yeah. I think she's focusing on the strategic point of view. That mm -hmm. if we lack the oil from, mm -hmm. I think I'm I'm interpreting you. So you you are telling her that if we remove Russia from from the suppliers, we need to replace with another suppliers mm -hmm. that is going to change the the balance between them. 
in the market. Is that your point? Yeah. Okay. Sure, but I think going, you know, again, responding to that, I think the point of like what we're trying to achieve with Russian oil flow is slightly different than, than gas, right? Because uh, because oil is so important for just the global today's energy supply, no one is saying let's completely shut, like that is not the policy. To completely shut down Russia's oil production, that is not the policy from US or, or Europe. Now, Ukrainians are going after uh, Russian oil fields, you know, a, a processing uh, facility, excuse me, uh, refining facilities, um, you know, and that's their strategy, which I think is really smart, but that is not a current strategy of US, Europe, or, you know, the like G7 allies uh, is, to st is to stop Russia from producing oil. Because that, if you were to do that to Russia today and find, in, you know, the only really way to do that would be through military action. And that, that is not on the table. That has not been, you know, that is not a strategy at all at the moment. The strategy that goes back to the, the price caps, the strategy is to keep Russia's flows on the market, but minimize how much profit they make off it. So, so just to clarify, there is really no kind of, and, and there are some countries in Europe that have an exemption, even though oil, oil, uh, seaborne oil is banned in Europe, but there are few countries, two or three countries that have exemptions that can still get piped oil from Russia because of how strategically it is important. And you're right, that means that, you know, if Russia was to, uh, uh, to reduce its oil production in the future, uh, some other producers around the world would have to step up, uh, whether in the Middle East, in the United States, uh, you know, Qatar, or in other in other areas around the world to fill the gaps. And how many are you familiar with OPEC? Um, OPEC Plus. Okay, so uh, some come, you know, uh, it's uh, several countries, Middle East, and several other, you know, the the plus is for Russia and others that have joined this coalition, and they. Um, this it's a cartel that talks about, you know, where does the oil production need to be in order to maintain proper pricing on the market. So, uh, and go going back to making sure there's competitiveness, right? So it's a it's a cartel. It doesn't include the United States and you know Western countries. Um, so they have some additional capacity. So if for some reason Russia stops producing oil at the capacity that it is today. Uh, U.S. has additional capacity that they can produce. Uh, OPEC and its members can decide and say we're going to produce more. They would have to make that decision. Currently, they've actually made some cuts in the next six months. I'm not saying these cuts, they have to, they will reassess uh, this summer and then they will decide do we extend the cut. So they actually decided all together to keep the prices high, to keep to keep those profits flowing they actually decided to cut a little bit of that production off the market. So they have additional capacity, but I'm not saying, you know, it's 100% enough immediately to fill in if Russia was to stop producing, but they're unlikely, and that's not a policy that we have uh, in the West, in US or in Europe to make Russia stop producing oil as of right now. So just to clarify. Thank you. More questions? I wanted to ask, uh, about a specific question about uh, how is the plan for the European Union and the US also for this uh, renewable plan of cars, these old fashioned carbon dioxide typical cars? Mm -hmm. And how is the plan? Because I find, I believe that it's kind of hard to, to get that transition going due to this periodic uh, crisis since 2008 that uh, affects also uh, the income of middle and low classes mm -hmm. and how can they afford these new uh, cars that are more sustainable and is there a plan to make it cheaper or more accessible to, to the market and how the demand and supply can be related? Sure and, and again speaking from a think tank like research uh, opinion not speaking on like in any shape or form like on behalf of the US or European le leaders you know just here as a researcher um, this is why when I was talking about this is how challenging systematic change is, you know, this is what makes it complex is, you know, just because you go in and you say, we're going to have a ban on all like gasoline, you know, your traditional vehicles, we're going to have this ban in, a, you know, in two to five or 10 years, just the ban alone, you know, that could be a really clear signal to the market 
But just the ban alone without going in and figuring out what kind of additional transformation and support schemes and systematic changes need to happen to, to uh, make sure that uh, the buyers of these cars or the, the drivers on the road are set up for success. You want to set up society for a successful transformation. And in order to do that, you brought up some really important points of making sure that if some people are forced to change and buy another, a new car. So making sure that there's proper either support or some kind of discounts. I would say that IRA is a Inflation Reduction Act is a really good example of, you know, U.S., uh, kind of pairing in some some states have these targets. There really isn't like a federal level, uh, you know, ban on any kind of, uh, you know, traditional vehicles. But IRA uh, provides a really robust incentive system for cars uh, that have lower emissions. Uh, and it's a really good example of supporting citizens in that, uh, in that tr uh, transition. So when you do and you go and buy the vehicle, you can get a certain amount of thousand dollars off uh, from that from that newer car, so that's just that's one that's one mechanisms of doing it, right? Uh, there's there's many many other structures on making sure that if if citizens are forced to change to buy something new to buy a new car or invest in something that you know there's either financing opportunities like financial uh, like you you know where you can take a loan or you can the car can pay for itself eventually or there's some kind of a support system uh for those that need it most if it's something that's mandatory right um and that's why then you also have to uh, pair it with the right system with the right um grid with the right charging systems in in this case if it's electric cars to make sure that no one is stranded as they're taking their vehicle across the country uh and that it's fast charging that it's not slowing down you know people's movement and the economic development that they're not sitting there for hours and hours waiting you know while the car is charging so expediting these processes so you're creating a system that sets people up for success so yes, uh, some kind of a, I don't want to say ban or some kind of a target of, you know, by this year, we want to have 50% of these types of vehicles. That's great. I actually think targets are better than, you know, come all out bans uh, because you want, when you have such massive change, you want to create some kind of flexibility. You want to also make it make it feel for citizens like they're choosing this path because it makes sense economically, because it makes sense for climate, their environment, they're breathing cleaner air. Um, and of course, uh, you know, there's going to be some people that will find it a lot harder to change and to see it this way. And there's some parts of the population that may never see it uh, this way. So you kind of have to figure out how do you set everyone up for success in moving through this massive transition, this massive, you know, transportation is a huge part of our economy from the time, from the point of how these cars are produced. Again, going back to where these materials coming from in this production, where these factories are set up across Europe. Because again, if we go back to really high energy prices in Germany, are these factories going to have to move somewhere else? And then getting those cars to the markets, to the consumers, can consumers afford these cars? And if they can't, where can proper amount, proper level of support be? And then once they actually afford them, where do they plug them in? And how do they ensure that their life, their economic development, they're going to work and back and traveling across their country or to neighboring countries, it's not impeded. So it's a systematic change and it requires systematic approach and it requires maybe some change and even good changes are hard. I think recognizing the human piece of the transformation of energy transition is really, really important. Even changing your habits, if it's even if it's towards something that's better for you, it's, it's just a hard thing to do. Doing anything differently is just hard. So recognizing that is the first step. But you're bringing up really good points of how to make sure that this massive change is done thoughtfully uh, and it's set up for success. Other questions? Any other questions? I do have one right here right now. OK. Because what are the main obstacles in the energy transition? I do have an answer oh, already, but okay. mm, but I'm not going to provide it. I, I want to know your opinion about it because this question was there was a part of okay, which are the the obstacles, which are the the barriers sure. that stop the transition to sure. happen or that slow down the transition even. Sure. First of all, let's start with financing. Okay. 
uh, making sure that the right financing tools and options are available. Each entity, you know, from private businesses to your uh, public, you know, house, public, publicly owned buildings to publicly operated entities um, have a role to play in this transition. So first of all, financing, making sure there is access to things like loans where, you know, finances that you have to give back, but also potentially grants in areas where particularly for disadvantaged parts of communities that may not have that initial. I'll, I'll, I'll go again uh, back to heat pumps as an example, because I think it's a fascinating example of why that initial financing is so important for good solutions. When you install a heat pump, eventually um, you will pay a lot less for your energy bill. So you're saving two thirds to even more of your of your heating and cooling bill, right? But you need to have that initial investment. So let's let's just roughly use uh, 10,000, just, you know, not, not all of them are priced differently depending on the technology, but yet for the ease, let's use the $10,000 figure and say, you know, asking a regular person to just shell out $10,000 to, up, you know, upgrade your heating and cooling system, that's a lot. But eventually that person is going to be saving money every single month and you're actually going to, the savings, you know, are going to pay for the for the for the new investment and stuff. So in this case, it's a more it's a household solution, uh, and there are multiple solutions like this where you need that initial support, that initial access to funding or loans. Now let's talk about larger scale financing. Um, so it could be anywhere from. Uh, you know, you have a massive public school, for example, that needs initial funding for some solar panels or some efficiency mechanisms. Uh, so that's that's the public piece of the discussion. Uh, when you're talking about decarbonizing like massive factories, financing for, you know, you're producing steel, financing and support. And again, I'm going to use IRA as an example. Um, you know, IRA today, uh, it's set up so openly that, you know, a massive factory producing like steel or something else would be able, if they can demonstrate the reduction in emissions, they would be able to access some financing, some support. So financing for these initial investments is really, really important. And having structured mechanisms to to get that money back as you're saving on energy costs, as you're reducing emissions, that's that's huge, that's massive. And I think financing for innovation, continuing to have investments there, but even financing for commercializations for newer technologies. So technologies that are proven, that we know works, for example, like we know for a fact that, you know, CCUS, carbon capture technologies work, we know hydrogen works, but we're not quite there where it's commercialized. What, what, what does it mean when I say commercialized? When this technology is so widely spread, it's so popular, it's so common that you just close your eyes and you know it's the project is done. Some of these newer technologies, we know they work, we know they're reliable, we know they're good solutions, but they're still not commercialized. There's not that efficiency. So you do need that initial financial support to kick off that mass production of this. So financing is huge and different tools for different communities to make sure that whatever that financing issue is, um, that it's addressed. Um, I would also say, uh, surprisingly, civil, civil society and just having uh, communities embrace projects, but even things like uh, battery production plants. Um, you know, going back to our supply chains, I think there's there's some pushback in some communities that are very pro clean energy and very much uh, are into, you know, net zero targets. A lot of communities just don't want to see either clean energy projects like wind farms or solar farms. I'm not saying all across, but there's some communities that are that want clean energy uh access but they don't want to see the projects not not close to them they don't want to see the grid uh, they don't want to see those you know those that kind of infrastructure it, they want to see beautiful views you know they're used to these views uh, they don't want that kind of uh that those views hindered or their environment hindered with these with these infrastructure investments that are necessary to get us to a clean energy future so i would say societal kind of understanding of what does a clean energy transition look like for my community uh, is a huge, huge, I think another, uh, again, critical minerals access is uh, in diversification away from China, another huge, huge barrier, making sure that we move forward with that. Otherwise, again, we're in a situation where we're just reliant on one country. 
Uh, I would say also permitting on, in both United States and Europe and different nations, different countries have uh, different issues, but expediting how quickly projects are approved without uh, sacrificing the environmental integrity and the assessment, not only environmental, but for this area, particularly historical assessment of, you know, before you build, understanding what you're dealing with in terms of the land, environmental impact, historical impact, but doing it expeditiously. That way, if this is a no-go, if you're saying this, there's too much environmental impact, you know, not making a company wait five to 10 years to find that out, because otherwise they're just sitting there waiting for that permit. They could have been exploring some other places. And I think an exciting opportunity in this area is AI, is utilizing in the future AI and automated assessment services to figure out how we can study environmental impact, historical impact and others of the projects, um, you know, as quickly as possible. That way you can know right away if, you know, if there's some very special species, like animal species living, you know, in this little area and you absolutely cannot build a wind farm here, you know, within, you know, within weeks. And then the company goes and they look for another, a better site. So finding ways to expedite permitting, uh, approvals, bureaucratic processes uh, without sacrificing other values like environmental integrity, communities, uh, and, you know, their opinions, um, and then historical value of, of the site. Um, there are others, but in terms of kind of the biggest barriers, I would say, you know, capital permitting, societal acceptance of, of projects and access to the different materials that are needed. But tell me your opinion. No, it's not bad in my opinion. My, uh, I would like uh, to have a more insight uh, part on the, because if you want a transition, you are transitioning from uh, status A to status B. Mm -hmm. But there are winners on the status A mm -hmm. that are not going to play the winning part in the status B. So my hypothesis is that a huge barrier in transition are the current winners of the system. Mm -hmm. What I mean is if you if we want to to, to change the energy supply uh, chain, uh, mm -hmm. we have to do it. Can we do it with the current players? No, that's a really, really important question. And I think, uh, you know, some of the Middle Eastern countries like UAE, uh, for example, come to mind. And I think the forward looking countries, um, we were just in Dubai for COP. I think the forward-looking countries, they understand it, they get it, they know where the future is, and they're asking themselves where do we want, you know, our economy runs on on this, on these exports. And what does the future look like for us? So how do we invest in clean energy and innovation in your technologies like hydrogen? Uh, there was a huge announcement of some of the Middle Eastern players um, massively investing in AI. Um, so, so I think, the players who are thinking forward and are thinking ahead are going to find a way to adjust to this new economy. And you're right, it's not an easy transition. It's not a fast transition, it's challenging. But those who are going to successfully continue to have economic growth in this new environment, they're already planting kind of, and they're already investing in these alternatives. Now we can have a debate here, whether yeah. are they investing enough and are they investing fast enough? And they, you know, is it diversified enough? Uh, you know, that, that's a conversation that I think we could have for hours and hours, whether, you know, well, some saying that they could be doing so much more and they need to be doing it faster. Some are saying, well, you know, if, if you were them, why not kind of, you know, play this out in terms of their export, what they can export, and then and then switch over to a slightly different economic setup. Um, so, no, it's, it's a really important question, but I think it goes back to Russia and kind of how the country has really, by, all, by investing in conflicts and war, <coughs> Russia has really set itself on this one trajectory where their economy is producing weapons of destruction and producing oil and gas and it's really sh like it used to have all sorts of you know investments in research and, and other areas and innovation and now it's really put itself on the this narrow pathway so the war is actually hurting russians and is hurting uh it's hurting the country um and it's really going to be really challenging for countries like russia to then take a step back if if they have the proper leadership board and say, how do we go back and we invest back into innovation and to other te technology? Because as right now, 
the only innovation is happening in how to create more destructive weapons in in in, in countries like Russia. So it is it is a really valid. It's a really good question. It's a valid question. Um, and I think some countries are more forward thinking about it. They're taking more risks and investing in newer technologies and being more realistic about how quickly they need to be there. And maybe some countries are taking, you know, seeing how, you know, they, they know that's the future, but they're seeing how how slow they can get to that future while ma maximizing their, their their profits, which, you know, it's an it's a economic incentive. Okay. Thank you. More questions? Yes. I'm not quite sure about this, but I heard that since the war in Ukraine is started, and therefore we, the West, are nowadays trying to rely less in Russia energetic supplies such as soil. And I heard as well that the US and the EU were looking to seek some treatments with the Venezuela a government mm -hmm. for real supply, being this country a close ally of mm -hmm. Putin's regime. And I just want to know how important is Venezuela in, in the current situation of need in Europe or if they are not important at all in the nowadays issue. Sure. And again, just to reiterate, uh, speaking here as a researcher, definitely not representing U.S. views or official U.S. policy in any shape or form. Um, you know, Venezuela is a very important partner. And I, I think with going back to our geopolitics conversation of kind of how to use energy relationships and energy ties to try to better, you know, try to improve democratic environment in, in countries and using those relationships as an anchor. Uh, we've seen that use, for example, when we talk about nuclear partnerships with some of our U.S. and some of the European countries. We've seen that as a beautiful, you know, like 100 year old, like year long, excuse me, partnerships. So I think when we look at countries like Venezuela and, you know, figuring out on how do we use, um, you know, how can we utilize uh, these kinds of partnerships to to bring countries potentially into a closer democratic fold while also figuring out what the supply situation will be like on the market. I kind of see twofold. You know, can can a relationship, can an energy relationship be utilized to improve the democratic situation? And it's a it's a standing question because in case of Russia, it didn't. Europe opened its arms and its doors and said, you know, let's let's build out Nord Stream 2. Let's build out those energy flows, because if we're interconnected with Russia, there is no way there's no way they will do something as stupid as wage a war on their neighbor, a full out war. Right. Because it would cost them too much economically. And it has cost them tremendously, tremendously. And they and they've lost their market share in Europe, billions of dollars of natural gas. This market share took decades to build. So when we're looking into trying to figure out what those future relationships are with countries that are as comple complex as Venezuela today and what that means for other agreements and other requirements. I think it's an opportunity, but it's not, you know, it's not a given again that some, you know, some kind of agreement, some kind of relationship would automatically lead to some kind of a democratic shift because it's we're seeing that it's more complex than that. It could be an answer in some cases or it could backfire in other cases, like in the case of Russia. But I think looking into alternative supplies that are out there in the market um, is, you know, is, is a reasonable question to be looking into. Thank you. Thank you. No, good questions. Any other question? No. Uh, in terms of energy security, uh, which we can define energy security in a different ways, but in terms we can say availability and affordability. Mm -hmm. Sure. So <clears throat> what about hydrogen technology? Yes. Because you mentioned nuclear mm -hmm. technology and nuclear technology. OK, that this could be a debate, but it, when it goes bad, <laughs> nuclear technology, either we destroy the world or we can have an HBO series and a magnificent HBO series. So. Uh, when nuclear goes wrong, it can go really wrong. But, but energy, um, hydrogen technology, it seems to be apparently perfectly clean. 
mm -hmm. uh, with uh, less problems of availability. Mm, so, do you have sure. any insight about? Sure. Um, and just and just to push back a little bit on, on nuclear. So, um, I actually, you know, was born in Ukraine. So I grew up in Chernobyl. So initially, I grew up just being like very negative, like my entire childhood, I had a very negative opinion of nuclear energy because all I could think about and all like the, anytime someone would say nuclear energy, I would think Chernobyl. And I would know people who were sick, who were impacted. Uh, so like initially, as I started like working in the energy field and all across both internationally and all across the United States and have toured uh, nuclear plants, um, I've really grown to love nuclear energy because I have a really hard time seeing if we genuinely want to get to net zero by the deadlines, we can't do it without nuclear. Now, again, I understand there's different views across Europe. I know that Spain is on the way to, to phase it out. Um, I do think for some countries, uh, you know, if you have other options, if you have such robust clean energy sources and other sources and you're so well connected with LNG terminals and others, um, it's good to have options. I think some countries, especially in Central and Eastern Europe for nuclear energy, that's not a whole lot of own like homegrown sources. So for them, nuclear energy and Soviet technology, Soviet level technology, not only technology, but operations and the lack of safety versus like the technologies that we have in the West here in the United States and in Europe, uh, in some of the other countries like Korea and Japan. Like that's a completely different conversation. I think being smart about the location of the plants, absolutely. But there's no other energy sector out there that is so closely regulated. Like every single tiny little step is so carefully watched and regulated and observed and managed. There's no other like like nuclear energy because of the concerns that you've mentioned. So LNG, natural gas, or even renewables or how critical minerals are, there's no that, that level of regulation or that level of insight. You know exactly what's happening with every component of the nuclear supply chain because of that. So I I personally think nuclear has a has a place. I understand there's divisions and not everyone shares that opinion. Again, I think for Spain, like having this nuclear expertise, that's a huge asset for your country. That's a huge, massive like that level of expertise. Other countries would do like they would love to have that that level of education, knowing how to operate nuclear energy, other countries are craving it. And I always look at real life examples of, all right, let's take a look at what happened to Germany. Germany phased out its nuclear energy. And again, now they're facing D, like it's just another option. So why why close the door on something? Why get why why get rid of an, of an option, right? When, when you can extend the lifespan and fine, if you maybe don't need as much of it, Great. Maybe if you end up using more renewable sources, that, that's fantastic. But then you can export more clean energy to other countries in the region. That's that's a financial benefit for you. Germany, you know, is now facing deindustrialization. They turned to coal because they phased out their nuclear plants. Um, you're just seeing examples of countries who phased it out too soon and now are really hurting in the, the future around how do they stay competitive, low priced uh, and clean uh, and low carbon. Uh, I just think it's an you know it's an opportunity. Why close the door on it? That's on hydrogen, very exciting new technology, and and again it's it's about creating a whole value chain. So how are you producing it? There's all these uh, conversations now around colors, colors of hydrogen. How many of you are familiar with the colors of hydrogen? It's basically how the hydrogen is produced. You can produce it from coal to you can produce it to nuclear to clean energy to solar to renewable to wind you can produce it in any way shape or form you can make hydrogen right and the colors you know the color scheme helps people understand if it's like this color it's green if it's gray it's natural gas and you know uh, it helps you understand how the hydrogen was made so again systematic approach how is the hydrogen made then what is it going, like, where is it going to? Which customers is it going to for what? What is it fueling? What is it powering? Where are you transporting in it? Uh, how is it being utilized, right? Um, and I think, you know, and who is the end, like, how is it produced? How is it utilized? How do you transport it? And how is it used? These are very basic questions. But I think as we think about the future of hydrogen, it's really important. And I think today, the biggest opportunities for hydrogen are these hydrogen hubs where you have more localized production in countries. I think Spain is a really interesting case in countries where clean energy. So if you were to make 
hydrogen with clean energy, you can make it with anything, but you can make it with wind and solar. If you have especially access capacity, access production, you make clean hydrogen there, here, and then you use it in a more localized way. You figure out whether, you know, it's powering a certain factory or, or this, or, you know, any kind of processes. I think the hydrogen hubs, is our, the next natural step. There are some people saying, you know, experts of hydrogen across the ocean from, you know, United States. I think, you know, maybe in like a product form like ammonia, I think we'll see greater development of hydrogen in a more localized way, both in the United States and in Europe. Uh, the re again, additional support for hydrogen through the IRA has been a huge boost for US. Lots of interest since that was announced. Uh, lots and lots more companies like doing research, figuring out how to enter the American market with, with, on hydrogen. I think it has a super important role to play. But again, thinking through a systematic approach of how are you going to produce it? Because if in the end of the day, you know, you produce it in such a way and then it takes you so long to deliver it across the world and then it's being used in an inefficient way where you're losing half of that power, you have to ask yourself, you know, what's, what was the, per like, why, you know, why did we do that again? Maybe we could have just used local, you know, some, something that already existed. So you have to ask yourself, you have to add up the carbon steps of that value chain. And if you add them up and it makes sense, then yes, let's do it. If it's, you know, if it's, uh, if it's at, the most effective way to do it is with access, clean energy production, because otherwise it just gets cur curtailed. It just gets wasted. So I think initially more localized production, utilization of hydrogen, is really kind of a good way to start. And then we can go into like more high, like long-term, like longer hydrogen pipelines and so on and so forth. But I think localized hubs is, is a good place to start.